On October 22nd, the majority of voters in British Columbia felt that Premier Bill van der Zam was fantastic. How do they feel about him now? The Premier tonight, but first here's Steve with the rundown. Political foot soldier Iona Campagnolo has stepped down as president of the Liberal Party, but she'll soon be filling other presidential shoes. She's coming up with Webster. He's put a whole new face on social credit and brought a new look to Victoria. But what has he accomplished so far as Premier? Bill Vanderzam is up first from our studios in Victoria. Good evening, Mr. Premier. Good evening, Jack. Uh, let me put it this way. You seem to be still quite fantastic, but you have managed to confuse me on more than a couple of occasions, principally on the countervail and a bit on the IWA strike. Tell me, how much clout did you have to use to get the union what it wanted in the IWA settlement to the dismay of the big forest companies? Well, they're both confusing issues, I'll grant you that. Certainly the countervail, perhaps, is the most confusing of all. And it's very difficult for people to really understand, as it is for us here sometimes, as to what it is that's taking place. With respect to the IWA, uh, obviously we attempted to give every assist we could during the whole of those many months. But in the end, uh, it was a proposal that came to our office, which we in turn presented to the union and to the companies, and we made available our deputy minister to sort of run between them and provide for the drafting, and we kept in constant contact, and uh, we also said at the time that if they couldn't resolve it then, that we would in fact go to legislation. Oh, I realize that, and, and you would in fact have put in the legislation what the final settlement was. Well, that's one option, of course. You don't now have tell to me, do that. Tell me, it seems funny. You've got a Royal Commission set up. Oh, have you picked the Royal Commissioners yet? No, we haven't because we're awaiting word from both the unions and the industry. We'd like to, uh, like to see them have lots of input and help in the selection of those people. I so they'll present names to us, uh -huh. and then we'll select either from that or additional names that we have available to us. One thing that bothered me was the fact that the Royal Commissioners finally is a non-binding and with your desire to find new ways to stop strikes, maybe you'll put the Royal Commissioner's recommendations in legislation and settle the industry down. Well, that's always a possibility, though. If they can't find a solution, I expect they'll be negotiating again come June of 1988. Now, uh, the, the other way, way where you upset the industry and Adam Zimmerman's was in your inflexibility in dealing straight on the 15% deal. Now, just one little question. I don't want to get confused. Is there going to be a deal based on 15% without the Americans infringing our sovereignty? Well, that's the part, of course, we don't know. As a matter of fact, when I uh, made mention of this a couple of days ago, it was in response. Uh, the call came to me in response to uh, something that appeared on your newscast. Yeah. And uh, basically, though I think perhaps the wrong words might have been used, we talked about agreement in principle, principle. as opposed to general agreement. All and right, there is you, a difference. Uh, but, uh, we're not, we have not yet got the total deal, but we should get it sooner. We won't get it at all. Well, the information I get, and I certainly keep well informed on the subject, I'm provided with information on a daily basis, is that we're basically agreed we have the 15 percent. I don't think there's any argument about that anymore, mm -hmm. and it's certainly not being mentioned, which is a good sign, because we can't have agreement if it's beyond the 15 percent. We've all made it clear we won't go beyond that. Okay. The difficulty is trying to, to work out the application of it. Uh, the export tax is not too acceptable to Alberta. Ontario doesn't like it either. They, as a matter of fact, would prefer to continue the fight in the courts, which will take three years, and our chances, because of politics, don't look too great. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the difficulty is trying to apply the 15% in Canada. How do we do this? Uh, well, don't let's muddy the waters anymore. Let's wait and see what you and Carney come up with in the final analysis. Well, right? it's Carney and Van der Zam and it's and Getty and else. it's Barassa. Let Those are the main players. Let me turn to something more provocative. You were very frank with me when I challenged you or questioned you on your apparently perceived conflict of interest on fantasy gardens. And after I challenged you, you are very... Uh, properly stepped away from the finance portfolio.
But I see in the latest book about Van der Zand by somebody called Twig, actually a piece written by John Twig, I think, he gives the impression you're in over your head with your six million dollars debt and that there's money trouble up ahead for you. Is he being right or is he being wrong? He, well, he's a nice fellow, but... Uh, yeah, but what do you think of what he uh, says? Well, he's not a businessman, he's a writer, and obviously he doesn't have a clue as to whether in fact, as a matter of fact, I think the comments came from a John Twig, who's perhaps best known to people as an assistant to the former Premier Dave Barrett. Yeah, I pointed so that out. take it with a grain of salt, and I can assure you that I feel very comfortable with Lillian's business. He's doing an excellent job. It's probably the best managed business in the province. And you're not in over your head. And, no. you, and Lillian is not in over her headband. No, Lillian's not in over her headband. And you'll see. get enough visitors at four bucks and two bucks to make your 600,000 a year in debt payments. Well, it's not just that. Of course, we have the little village there, which is very attractive and has a lot of people no participating in it. No commercials. Oh, well, how do, you, how do you want me to explain that? It's a wonderful venture if you won't let me explain it. Well, I don't want you to be a full time businessman. I want you to be a full time prim pr I am, premier. But you asked the question. I'm only responding. Okay. Next question. Um, are you embarrassed by the actions of your transportation and highway minister, Cliff Michael, who's sending around this pro apartheid propaganda in which Joe Clark is called a pompous ass and Tutu is called a clown? Well, first of all, have let you me read explain. the piece? I've, I've read the piece. I've spoken to the minister, and the minister obviously doesn't agree with the comments that were made about Mr. Clark or about His Excellency the Bishop. You know, but he simply sent this about his information to his colleagues to say, from his standpoint, there are other views with respect to how we might deal with South Africa. But and you know, the one thing that we continually hear is that somehow if you say you're against sanctions, then you're pro-apartheid. That's not the case at all with Cliff Michaels or with Bill van der Zam. And I don't think it's the case with the person that wrote the article. It didn't appear to me that way. Anyway, you've dropped. You're not going to try and deal with South Africa anyway because you realize that's the federal territory in which you cannot put your nose. Well, if somebody in British Columbia wants to sell 50,000 or 100,000 or more prefab homes to South Africa, they might try and work out a deal with the private people in that country. And that's still their privilege. They can do so now. And you would endorse such a thing? Uh, I would certainly not oppose the sale of these prefab homes that have been talked about to South Africans. They're to house black people, they're small units, and it's good, it's good housing for people in need of housing in a country which we want to assist, we say, and it's also our people we want to assist, and it's also good business for British Columbia. It means people get employed. I'd much sooner they bought them in British Columbia than someplace in Eastern Europe. Okay, next point. Um, uh, what was my next point? Oh, yes. You're having a dreadful, when are you, when are you gonna call a session? Early in January? No, I think it'll be more like late February, and I already gave that message to the leader of the opposition that probably we were looking at sometime after mid-February. One session or two sessions in the year? Hopefully one. If we can deal with the people's business in one session, all the better. It saves them money, and if we can do the democratic, properly, uh, democratic process properly in the spring and summer months as we've done it previously, that suits me. What's your operating deficit at the moment? Just to warn us that you won't have any money for universities, schools, hospitals, etc., etc. Well, you know, the deficit obviously is probably somewhat larger because of the disputes that we've suffered from. It's been a blow to the economy. And um, I expect it'll be up by something like 10% over what the initial predictions. I don't like it, be but we're faced. We're faced with that, and we're not out to cut programs. We're going to try but and work to keep all of the programs intact. Wouldn't you have to cut programs with the loss of all the uh, stumpage, for instance, on this strike-ridden year? How can you possibly start giving out grants uh, in aid for students, even though we have the most shameful lack of grant program in the country? Well, the grant program, I don't want to get into the details of that, but it's not as bad as some make it out to be. As a matter of fact, some would say it's a good program and are supportive of it. 
but we're looking at the grant program. The minister has already visited one of the universities, intends to visit them all, meet with students, and if we can bring about some positive change, we'll do so. Well, you started to see the Bank of BC almost so closely down the tube that it had to be rescued by the Hong Kong Bank? Well, one of the first things that I faced when I took office in early August was the Bank of BC. And we attempted to work this out in, in, in a variety of ways. At first, we thought perhaps by the province becoming involved a little bit and the federal government becoming involved, we could rescue it. Although, mind you, of course, it's not our philosophy to become involved as a government in this sort of thing. We looked at all of the alternatives. As you know, Van City took an interest. They looked at it. Frankly, uh, they're a good concern, but they're taking on a big chunk if they attempted to uh, take over the Bank of BC. The Bank of Hong Kong was a better option than one of the nationals, one of the big five or six, and uh, we, uh, we weren't at all displeased with that. They're a good bank, they've got lots of assets, they'll do a lot for our province, they'll keep the retail operation going, people uh -huh. employed, they'll bring money into the country from the Pacific Hopefully. Rim, and they'll open up a further window and give us an opportunity to build for Vancouver an international finance center. So it's good news. More with Bill Van Der Zam, Premier Van Der Zam, and your calls too after the break. Hello, one, two, three. You mean they can't hear me? No, we can hear it. Okay. No, Yeah, that's right. I've just been smoking my pipe. There's no change. It must be something on the line. Probably the CBC sabotaging. Sabotaging. I was in the tunnel cutting the wires. You say it's a bit raspy? No, it's fine. I don't think it's a problem. Thank you. Yeah, that's the problem, you know, oh, it's yeah, true. Yeah. They're going to take advantage of it. Have the feds in the East uh, come through about your complaints or the way we get robbed of federal money? For instance, have you any assurance on the polar icebreaker? I don't have the assurances yet, although, mind you, when I met with the ministers in Ottawa, they all appeared very positive. They certainly had no disagreement with the presentations given them. They know that we're being shortchanged. No promises. Oh, uh, th do they admit that we're being shortchanged? Oh, absolutely. Who There's admits, no question. Which, which cabinet ministers admit we're being shortchanged? Well, now, wait a minute. You're going to ask me to name all of those cabinet yeah. ministers that I only met for the first time. But How I mean, about Mulroney? Uh, I think Mulroney does not disagree with our stance, nor does Mazankowski, nor does Clark, uh, nor does Cote, nor do, do any of the other ministers I met with. Uh, Madame Savigny, no, they're all very Good. agreeable. Good. Now, I have a little bit of a problem I'll share you with tonight. I was going to interview Edgar Kaiser tomorrow night by arrangement, and I wanted to ask him about his pension, you know, because I was one of the people who helped flog the Bank of BC stock up to $9, with your predecessor, Mr. Bennett, in my program. Now Mr. Kaiser doesn't want to talk to me because I want to talk about his pension. Do you think that that uh, $700,000 package, the five-year no-cut contract, and 100000 a year was a good thing for uh, Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Board to get when the bank was in such bad financial condition? 
Well, I guess the answer in retrospect is probably they couldn't afford it. And when you can't afford it, you shouldn't do it. But then it's easy to, to look at things in retrospect. I don't know what all of the considerations by the board at the time, so I, I really can't comment much on it. And I should point out that Mr. Kaiser and his associates probably dropped about 60 million on that private financing they did for the bank. Well, Mr. Kaiser himself took quite a beating because he's also a major shareholder in it, so what about I really brick? don't have too much comment on that. What should we do with our brick stock now? Tear it up and throw it away? Uh, well, it's um, Blow a buck. It's so cheap right now, it's hardly worth tearing up. I would simply pack it away for just a little bit. Maybe something will happen. Oh, by the way, is, are you considering appointing Mr. Kaiser to any government positions? Uh, well, I suppose his name may come forth from uh, a list mm -hmm. that's being presented by management union on, on a variety of topics mm. and if it does we'll certainly look at all the names mm -hmm. well I'll put my name up too you'd be great Jack do you have the time to do it are you volunteering now because there's no pay for it it's all voluntary it all depends on my ratings <laughs> <laughs> okay we'll try some You're phone great. calls we're going live on phone calls which one go ahead to the premier Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment, Mr. Van Der Zam, and actually Mr. Webster as well. I think it's rather hypocritical for us to sanction South America when we don't sanction and actually trade with countries such as Russia and South America where human rights are violated. I'm going to hang up to listen to your response. Thank you. Did you hear it? Well, I think uh, the lady made a point that I've made many times with respect to sanctions as they affect South Africa in that uh, I think Mr. Clark himself said recently uh, sanctions against the Soviet Union over their actions in Afghanistan haven't worked. Mm. So I don't think they work. I don't believe you put people down and, and try and take their homes and their food uh, through sanctions yeah. and think that this somehow will straighten the country. I Mind don't believe you, it. If we'd known about it in Hitler Germany in the 30s, sanctions might have worked for them. Total sanctions. However, that's another story. Go well, ahead. Now, yeah, okay. Go on. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Mr. Premier, you said that in August you uh, had to deal with the Bank of B.C., and I can't help but remember Mr. Kaiser wandering around the convention floor in uh, Whistler touting your name for the leadership of the province. I wonder how much influence Mr. Kaiser uh, supporting you at the uh, convention had to do with your support of the Bank of Hong Kong over a local institution, Van City. And my second point is, oh, I think on South minute. Africa, I think... Just a minute, just a minute. One good question deserves one good answer. Yeah. I don't think Mr. Uh, Kaiser was at all involved in any of the negotiations between Van City and the bank and the federal government, nor was he involved in any of those negotiations with the Bank of Hong Kong. So frankly, to accuse Mr. Kaiser of steering in a particular direction for his own interest is grossly unfair. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to know, now that Expo is over, will you be lowering transit fares to what they were before Expo started? No, I don't think we can lower transit fares. Well, if we I, was lower under the, I was under the understanding that uh, the, the previous government said that once Expo was over, the transit, fare, transit fares would be lowered. I've not heard that said, and frankly, I don't know how they could have said that, because if you lower transit fares, you're going to have to find the money someplace else, and that means taking it away from another program, and I'm sure there are lots of reasons and arguments for keeping the programs that we presently have, whether it's education, health, or social services, intact. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, Mr. Vanderzam. Um, unemployment seems to be a big issue in the province, and I remember uh, about eight years ago, uh, I was working in a, in a drug store, and we hired a, a young lady to come in and work for us, and I believe that the government, I don't know if it was the federal or the provincial government, subsidized part of her wages, like a UIC kind of deal, and, and we paid the other part. Has, have you given that any thought to trying that again? or? Well, uh, we're presently, of course, dealing on a daily basis with what it is that we might do in order to stimulate the economy. Frankly, I don't support programs that direct monies to particular industries. Uh, you know, if people get monies for hiring people at a particular time, the problem is often in that sort of process where government intervenes, they begin to wait for those sorts of times. And instead of us being beneficiaries and all benefiting from it, we tend to lose by this. So 
I don't like those sorts of programs. I would instead prefer some universal benefits, be it deregulation or be it perhaps a better tax structure or be it possibly uh, a better climate labor-wise so we don't have the disputes that we've so become accustomed to. If all of those things can be addressed, I think that's far better than trying to pour money by whatever means and however much into industry or business. Mr. Van der Zandt, I must get your reaction on the steps taken by the BC Council of Human Rights to fine an employer $3,600 because they wouldn't follow through in the hiring of a woman who was within six weeks of giving birth and who, when she was told she had the job, just said, thanks very much, but I'll need the maternity leave soon. Do you think the Council of Human Rights is a little bit too tough in protection of pregnant women in those circumstances? Well, you know, uh, I can only look at the face of it, as I'm sure most people do now, because they only have what the information available from the media. I suppose, being the premier, I know I could get further information from the Human Rights Council. Uh, but based on what it is we saw and what appeared in the paper and, uh, and throughout the media, um, I was a little surprised, frankly, and uh, I could see where this sort of thing might go too far and again begin to work against people and against their rights as opposed to helping them. A very modest response, Mr. Van der Zandt. I congratulate you on it because it was quite an incredible story and I was talking the other night like you would have talked 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, I noticed today that the mayor of Chilliwack finally resigned, and I'm wondering if <clears throat> you can put a little <clears throat> pressure on your running mate in Richmond, because I think it is very unfair that he is now holding two provincially paying jobs and one Richmond paying job, which would be a conflict of interest in my estimation. Oh, yeah. Also, I but hold on, hold on. One question's enough. Is that talking about Mr. Lewin, is it? Lunin, that's right. Lunin. He's, well, he's an MLA, and, and he's also an alderman, is that right? That's correct. Is that proper or improper? Well, he does not intend to, nor should he intend to carry on in those two functions. Uh, the mayor of Chilliwack, the mayor of Matsqui, uh, the mayor of Cowichan all have resigned in order to take on this particular function of MLA full time. Uh, the, the alderman, Nick Lunin, my running mate in Richmond, has already indicated to me, and he consulted counsel himself, that he would also resign, but he would wait until after the new year, as soon as the session is called, and then tender his resignation. Thank you. One more short segment with Premier Van der Zam. Fantastic after the break. <laughs> Uh, don't fall off your chair, Mr. Premier, but I must compliment you, too, on Thank your availability you. to shows like mine and the media. But are you not getting a bit weary of being on stage all the time, and won't you start, perhaps, to go back into a little shell? Well, hopefully not. I'm going to keep uh, trying to be myself and uh, being available to the media or meeting with groups and individuals, although it is difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, they tell me in my office we get on the average 88 requests for speaking engagements per week. Uh, we're getting something like five to 600 letters a day. Uh, the phone calls, it's impossible to keep up. So, yes, it's a bit overwhelming, but I appreciate the media because it does answer a lot of phone calls and a lot of letters. So, therefore, I take every opportunity I can. Television in the chamber, in the house, when are we going to have it? We'll have television cameras there for at least some of the things come uh, the sitting in February. Although we won't have full television installed as we would see it in other houses where they in fact can direct the cameras to a specific person without panning until um, in the fall. Go ahead, uh, please, to Premier Van der Zandt. Premier Van der Zandt, what is going to be done for students who leave university uh, with a degree, uh, can't find a job, and have a BC student loan to, be, to pay back? Um, six months down the road, is simply defaulted with no recourse. The federal well, government has a has a um, has an interest relief program for people who are on um, unemployment insurance and cannot pay. Well, we also have uh, a means of uh, 
giving you uh, time to, uh, to pay it off or to give you a break on it. That's all in place. How do you, how do so you find if you out don't about have that? All I haven't of the been able to find out about it even from the uh, student loans office in Victoria. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I regret that because certainly the information is available from... Uh, I would suggest you go to your MLA's office and we'll certainly get the information through the ministry to you or if you write the minister or myself, we'll make sure you get the information. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello, yes. Um, I don't want to have a confronting attitude when I ask this question, but I'm really curious if you saw a man alive last night on uh, apartheid in so South Africa. No, I didn't. I don't think the Premier did either. No, I didn't. Okay. I was attending a function last night for a long time public servants. Yeah, I have, I, from what they said, it is available to view, and I know it was a shown in Canada. Yes? Ask a question. Okay. Um, well, if you haven't seen it, it's not going to make a lot okay, of sense. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Got me off that hook. Go ahead from Prince George. Yes, I'm calling about the countervailing duty. Uh, I'm in the management end of a sawmill up here, and uh, in 1983, the council beat this duty business. And I think that the way Carney and Van Der Zam and Kemp and Monroe are acting, we're asking for problems. I don't think we've got a bottomless well here. Uh, if we get 15% uh, duty on plus an increase in stun stumpage the way they're talking about, uh, and the Indians sniping at us and the IWA sniping at us, how far are we going to go? We're going to go broke. Mr. Van Der Zam? Well, first of all, it's not 15% plus. And secondly, it's not Ms. Carney and Bill Van Der Zam and Jack Monroe. It's everybody. Already back in August, when I first started to inquire about this, our own people said, you know, if it was strictly a moral or a legal question, we could possibly win it. But with all of the politics and with all of the uh, protectionism in the U.S., we don't think we stand that good a chance. Uh, I had dinner with a good group of lawyers representing the industries, at Ontario Place during Expo in September, the message from them was exactly the same. The industry, in fact, advised us to find a way by which we would keep the money in Canada as opposed to having it going across the U.S. We had agreement from industry, we had agreement from the union, we had the advice from all of the lawyers and all the legal beagles, both provincially and federally. We didn't go it on, on our own. Now, some people, are calling for us to go to the courts instead, including Ontario, because it'll, I suppose, for, for one thing, they don't have that much at risk. Ontario is only about five or six or seven percent at the most of all lumber exports. So to them, they're looking at other issues. Right. How will it affect other things in Ontario? For some businesses, perhaps 15 percent in the country by way of stumpage is better or pardon me, is not as good as what a duty, because a duty could be removed at some time, whereas a stumpage once in place tends to stay there. And I agree with that. And of course, the other argument is that it puts up the price of all the stumpage, increases the price of all of our goods going to all markets over the world. That's fair, and these are the sorts of things we're trying to address in these negotiations now. But I assure you, the gentleman that called, that we didn't make this decision lightly or in isolation. We had all of the best advice, and at some point you have to make a decision. It, and if we can keep the money in our country, so much the better. The big danger is, though, if the Americans get any kind of suzerainty or sovereignty looking over our shoulders, then they could tack on pieces saying, why did you give, say, uh, a cheaper power rate to that mill? That's more subsidy. Up goes the the tax, right? Well, I agree with you there. It's certainly uh, a problem. They're going to be watching us all of the time, not only on lumber, but on other things, too. Paul? And we're going to have to change some things in this country. Uh, and, you know, the Americans know about this, and we may as well admit it. We have provinces competing with one another for industries. We have industries leaving British Columbia to go to some other province because the province pays them per employee to move there. Alberta. We have the federal government giving industries money to settle in, a, in the Atlantic provinces. And these sorts of things, obviously, don't sit well with people that are competing elsewhere with these same industries. So we need to look at that. We can't go on doing things as we've been doing them too long. Go ahead to Premier Van der Zam. Yes, Mr. Premier. Uh, there's been talk of uh, special economic zones with tax breaks for uh, 
R&D and developing trade uh, with uh, Pacific Rim countries. I'm wondering if uh, you're going to go ahead with this and whether within these zones uh, an investor will be able to have a union or non-union shop protected from uh, you know, LRB uh, rulings uh, so that people aren't afraid to uh, invest in such zones such as they are in uh, BC right now. Well, I think maybe we're going a bit too far when we start uh, saying, you know, we should somehow make it so that labor rules and, and labor practices don't apply in these zones. And we may be going too far when we are saying we're going to give special tax concessions to the people there. But if we could simply provide the opportunity for the manufacturer in Taiwan or Hong Kong or Japan or Europe or wherever to bring components to a zone in Vancouver or outside of Vancouver or anywhere in the province and take these components, bring them in duty-free, tax-free, manufacture the finished good and ship any place they want to ship, including into Canada, at which time they play the duty, then I think that would be fair enough. Well, let's do it. You know, we've got to get something happening here, and uh, you know, we've got a sad economic picture, and uh, right now people are afraid to invest here. Good. One last question from me, Mr. Premier. Uh, where are you going for Christmas? Fantasy Gardens. I beg your pardon? Where are you going for Christmas? Well, I'm hoping to stay home in, uh, yes, in Richmond, and to visit relations in Surrey and elsewhere, close to home. I'm not going anywhere. There's no time to go on holidays. We have to stick to the business of the province. You can stick to the business. I'm going on holidays. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas to you and Lillian. The very same to you, Jack, and to everyone at BCTV and all of the people watching. My thanks to Premier Van der Zandt. You can't help but like the guy. Back after the break. <laughs> Jack, will we come up cold on Iona then? Clear the lines. No, come up cold on me. Okay. Well, you just ended with saying you're going on a holiday. Perfect segue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're holding six, nine. No, they're all going with it. Half foot, yeah. Well, he's still at half foot. Yes, right away. Yeah. Phones up. Let me make an explanation. I am sitting on the wrong side of the desk. I feel vulnerable, nervous, shy, chittering with fear. Because I don't normally sit on that side of the desk. And let me tell you, I've been sitting in the other side of the desk for 33 years, doing radio and television talk shows until I tell my replacement for Christmas, who is, of course, the inimitable, indomitable Iona Campagnola, that one time I had answered so many telephone calls in my career that if anybody came to the door of our house in West Van, I would open the door and say to whoever it was, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> I know how you feel, Jack, because I can't even get into a chair without reaching for a seatbelt. <laughs> yeah. Now, you, of course, are quite an experienced broadcaster in your own right. Well, I had two years of television, nine years of radio. That was one of a kind, the television. Yes, and radio. And nine years of radio. Mm -hmm. And I thought the best way to kind of get you launched tonight in doing this job until I come back from Hawaii was to go for a free-for-all. Now. Do you feel embarrassed by the fact that you're a former president of the Liberal Party sitting here in an opinion where you'll be in a place where you might well be required to make instant judgments or give instant opinions? Can you be non-partisan? I think I can. I mean, I have to say that Premier uh, van der Zem has certainly improved his uh, delivery. I thought he gave a very good pr account of himself tonight, very smooth. Yeah, as a matter of fact, you were saying to me, is this the same guy we knew five, six or seven years ago? Yeah, which is the real one? And uh, I hope that my left-wing friends, of which I have perhaps more than you have... I doubt it. We'll fight over it. I, I hope that they forgive me for... Not forgive me, I don't give a damn what they think, for actually saying that you got to give Van der Zandt credit. Well, He I makes life very pleasant, providing we don't get uh, bogged down by his charm. It's all very well to talk about open government. We can't yet decide whether or not it is an open government. Well, you know, you brought it up when you introduced me. There is a very close relationship between the media and the public person, and sometimes it's uh, almost blurred, the line between. I think 
the real problem, Jack, is what's the content? What's the substance? What do people think? That's what you've been doing for 33 years. Yeah, and I always prefer the information aspect of the program. I'm glad, for instance, to see this campaign just now by seniors. I and mean, here you go political at once against this new Tory bill on the protection of the multinational drug patents. Well, we're going to be talking to some of those people on Monday on the show. I hope you'll watch if you're not on your way to Hawaii already. Well, I won't be on my way to Hawaii then. But let's go to okay. the courts. Okay, now, now tell first me of how all, it works. The white one is not yours. Uh -huh. Green on is hold. on hold, and you can transfer them to on air by pushing the red button. And uh -huh. Jeanette tells us which call is let's next Let's start up. with number one then. Okay. You're on the air. Hello. Hello? Hi. Hi. Jack and I want to talk to you. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? Pretty good. Uh, I, I thought I'd like to talk to Jack because I haven't talked to Jack and uh, been able to talk to Jack on the other side of the fence. Well, be my guest. He's right on the other side of the table. Well, actually, it's not about you, actually. It's about an issue. But I was wondering if you could tell me, what do you think about the Liberal Party when they had those, uh, those uh, well, I don't know what you call it, but they had the uh, little agreements there, and, and one of the things they wanted was no uh, nuclear-powered ships in, in, in the harbors. No, no, you're talking about the switch, swing to the left of the Liberal Party, as, uh, as expressed by the delegates at the recent le leadership convention. And I must tell you, it was quite a swing to the left. Yeah, I, I would say I just well, dropped the Liberals right there, I'll tell you, and I wouldn't pick up the Conservatives. But doesn't that worry you? I don't know how you feel about that, but I mean, don't you think that if Canada is unable to defend themselves, that we should at least, uh, you know, uh, do our bit in, in the world to uh, to protect the way our life is. Well, there's a very important issue in Britain just now where Kinnock has said he'll pull right out of all nuclear things. But thank you for your call anyway. That's it. Well, Nothing. you're on the air. Go ahead. Hello, Iona Cavanova. Yeah, here. I want to say and how Jack. much I appreciate that you've uh, taken this job on. And I have to uh, commend the people of BCTV. I think they've got themselves another winner. Well, they're pretty brave. I think we ought to have Jack and me together. Don't you think we make a good combination? I think so, okay. and I very much admire you for what you've been through. I just wanted to tell you that. Thank you very much. Right. Well, let's go down here. Yeah, yeah, kill that one first. Oh. Yeah, hello? Yeah, okay. yeah, thank you. You're on the air. I'll be on next? Yes, You're on now. On. You're on now. Yeah, hello? Go ahead. For me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, hello. Uh, hello, Iona. Yes, yes. Jack but, and I are here. Now, being that you left the Liberal Party, are you, uh, are... Uh, what, what's your job next? I'm not, I haven't left liberalism. I have just decided that I'm going to go into a private sphere for a time, and I'm starting off with uh, substituting for Jack while he goes on holiday. So I hope you'll call in again. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I, use, I uh, seen you as an MLA up there in Prince Rupert. And yeah, I, MP. I, MP, you're right. Thanks so, for calling. Uh, thank you. How long since you were an MP in Prince Rupert? Uh, 1979. 79. Yes, quite All a while. All the battles about the Northern Transportation That's Allowances. That's right, coastal Come allowances. Back. What's yes. the next call? Well, we've taken that. Oh, What's here we go. Them? You're on the air. I'm on the air. Yep. May I ask Iona a question, please? You can ask it. I'm not saying I'll answer. <laughs> I see. Go ahead. Could you tell me, please, what is Jack Poole's position in the Liberal Party? seems to be getting stronger and stronger. Well, he, he arranged the last dinner here in Vancouver. That's the only position I know about. Thank you very much. Number five. No, no, we're past that one. Give us some more. Eight. OK. You're on the air. Hello, Iona. Hello. Uh, Iona, could you tell me whether you're going to be involved in the, uh, in the BC Liberal Party? Um, uh, see, Art Lee's his heart is there, but I feel his direction is not quite um, the way it should be at this time. Well, there'll never be one in this province until they make up their mind that they're not going to be in a coalition with either of the other parties. Thank you for calling. Thank you. We'll take that one next. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Jack and Iona. Welcome, Iona. I think, uh, like the other gentlemen, BC TV has made a, a good move there. Thank you. With having you here, uh, maybe you do a good job. We can have uh, half you and half Jack. <laughs> Jack, did I believe my ears when you were interviewing the Premier that you might be coming farther to the right and the Premier is coming farther to the left and the two of you have already passed on the cross? Are you talking to me? Yes. Well, I wouldn't say that. I'm given to little asides, which I modestly think are sometimes funny, but on that particular issue of the pregnancy woman in the B.C. Council of Human Rights, Mr. Van der Zandt gave me such a modestly reasonable response when I know perfectly well that five years ago he'd have been demanding the end of the Council of Human Rights in that no pregnancy should interfere with an employee's rights to do whatever he wanted with his employees. Right, all right. Uh, and finally, Mrs. Campanola, yep. uh, 
the recent convention in uh, in Ottawa, the Liberals and the New Democrats, according to one of the polls on the news the other night, are about neck and neck. Do you see the Liberals gaining uh, new and uh, and uh, and uh, important strengths in the West? Yes, I do over a period of time because I think that the people of Canada want moderation. I mean, look what miracles we've worked tonight. Uh, Mr. Van der Zam and Webster are already sounding quite alike. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Two names. Uh, number, there we are. Right. Got it. You're on the air. Thank you. Hello, Iona. Yes. Yes, it's Julie Adams. I used to be from Prince Rupert from our drama days. Yes. And I'm just wishing you all the best and I'm glad that you're uh, going to be helping out Jack with the show and enjoy listening to both of you. Well, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hello, you're on the air. Yes, hello. I'd like to talk to Jack, please. please Go sir. ahead. Jack, uh, you got your Oxford Marlboro Brigham underwear on. Have I got my what? Your Bal Brigham underwear. Bal Brigham underwear. Your Oxford Marlboro Brigham. Oxter Ball Brick and Underwear. No, I haven't. We've got air conditioning in this country. We don't need to go back to those savage Scotch I, habits. I hope you'll not be thinking I'm a tiggle in the clique when I ask you, when are you going to put out another tape like you did the other, a few years ago, about when you sold newspapers in Scotland? <laughs> That'd be uh, fun. I think that's for my, my great-grandfather. I can Here barely understand the man. Okay, now long it's up distance to you. from Windy. No, it's, now it's up to you to say we'll be back after the break. Oh, we've already got this. All right. Um, we'll be back after the break. <laughs> I didn't lose him. Check him. No, you didn't lose him. I just think so when you're talking. The monitor, yeah. I was it's watching. Right, in, right into the camera. Okay. okay. I sure. look like a battle of love. <laughs> I'm Iona Campanello, and Webster and I are busy doing a free for all. So, shall we take this long distance call from Winfield? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're on the air. <coughs> Hello, Iona. Yes. Congratulations on your new position. Well, it's a short term one, I assure you. It's just like the old movie, The Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> I have a beautiful holiday, but Thank you won't you. ruin my, my Christmas dinner this year. Okay. <laughs> Thank Good you. Good luck to you. Bye-bye. <laughs> we'll, we'll go to another line now. Number. You're on the air? Hello, Iona. Yes. Uh, you've had experience both as a broadcaster and as a cabinet minister. I was wondering if you could comment on... Uh, why Jack Webster never went into politics? And if he did, uh, what party would he go to, into? And would it be federal or provincial level? And basically, how do you think he would do? I've always thought that Jack Webster is the rightful premier of British Columbia. And uh, as for a party, I think a man with his social conscience would have to choose a, a middle centrist party of no name in this province. I also think that Webster is probably going to do that one of these days, go into politics. What, about, what do you think? Tell me now. Well, Don't just sit there and look at me. Tell me, why aren't you a politician? No comment. <laughs> no, quite seriously. I often have regrets that I did not pin my beliefs to a political flag. But as I got older and a little wiser, perhaps, and a little more cynical, I realized that to be a faithful member of a political party, if elected, you must do two things. One, sit in misery on the bank bench for many years, perhaps, and two, obey the whip. And uh, my views are now so all around the clock that I can't really think. I, for instance, couldn't run for the NDP because of the doctrinaire people in the NDP who drive me around the bend. I couldn't run for the Liberals because they contain a fair amount of hypocrisy and old-style politics, which I don't like. I certainly couldn't run for the Conservatives. My father, God bless him, would turn over in his grave. And I could not endorse running as a social creditor. So what I've done is I've painted myself into a corner as an old, supposedly independently-minded maverick who is of no earthly use to any political party. Absolutely dead wrong, and I predict that you'll get about 40 requests between now and springtime to reconsider. <laughs> 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 We're going to go to another call, and uh, you are on the air. Oh, yes. Uh, congratulations, Sayona. Thank you. And uh, Jack, I was quite surprised at your amorphous accolade that you gave uh, Mr. Vanderzam. And uh, the question to you, Iona, is um, how do you feel Mr. Turner will, uh, will he comment on the recent polls? He does not like to comment on polls at all, but uh, will he comment now? 
you're going to get a chance to see him tomorrow night with Webster, and you know no one can resist Webster when he asks them to do something on uh, camera. So I think we'll have to wait and see if he can get it out of him. Uh, obviously, he's going to be very pleased with the poll, and I think it's going to be a time when you see uh, the fact that they did pull together, they were unified, and they did support their leader. However, he does not like to uh, comment on polls, good, bad, or indifferent, usually. Yeah. Well, oh, I think he'll you. comment on the present polls when he's leading the party and leading the country. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. And now we're going to go to this call. Hi, I'm not uh, uh, quite a, going to be quite as polite as the others. I, I hope we're not going to get a couple weeks of uh, liberal propaganda, although I must say... Uh, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> you're pretty brave to even uh, uh, identify yourself as a liberal out here. Uh, recently, uh, a, an economist pointed out that the national energy policy stole about $90 billion from the West and has caused the collapse of the Bank of BC and other banks. I suggest you call tomorrow night and ask Mr. Turner that question. Thank you. Bye-bye. That's a good one. Yes, good. Yeah, I've often been accused of being a rude on telephone, and I, you won't have the same problem. But what I always say in self-defense, and that wasn't a bad call at all, is no. it? You, you've got to be brusque and you've got to move along quickly. And if you find somebody who's waffling all over the lot, you know, it spoils the program for everybody else. So now and again, you'll find you get chopped, whether it's by me or whether it's by... I, I have to tell uh, the listeners and viewers that today you told me to be ruthless. Here we go <laughs> to Prince Rupert. You're on the air. Hi, Owena. Hello. Uh, calling from Prince Rupert, I'd like to congratulate you on your short-term... Uh Oh, yes, it'll be great fun. Thank uh, you. The question I have for you is, uh, when are you going to come back to Prince Rupert and uh, you know, run as uh, mayor to replace uh, Pete Lester? Pete Lester has been mayor of that city longer than Jean Drapeau was mayor of Montreal. Drapeau. Absolutely incredible record. You know, he's been the, the longest serving mayor in Canada, I think. So I would never contest him. I think he that... He talks of running as mayor. Oh, he says he's not going to run every time, but he always does. I think he'll be mayor for the rest of his life. <laughs> Thanks for calling. And now we're going to go to Abbotsford. Hello, Abbotsford. Hi, how are you? Fine, how are you? Fine, thanks. Mr. Webster, I must direct my comments directly to you. I have been watching your show for years, and I really certainly, indeed, I admire the way you are so upfront with people and bold. You know, if the politicians in our country took the same stand as you did in the province of BC on dealing with the issues, Boy, this country would be on its feet. Well, I'll tell you, sometimes I feel that I flop in my job because I haven't been quite upstanding enough. Uh, uh, although I was saying to Iona earlier on, after 33 years, one tends to have one's brain run in patterns of provocation, sometimes unfairly to people, too. That's one of the dangers of being so long in the tooth in this business, but it's nice of you to say so anyway. Oh, we love you, Jack. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, Hooray. we all do. More like that. And here's another one. Let's hope there's another one. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, congratulations. Thank you. Listen, I've uh, always been a conservative, but you'll be happy to know now that I'm fed up with the, with the conservatives. And, um, Why? Gonna... But my question to you is, um, I've always seen on the, on the radio and the newspapers that the Liberals and the NDP always vote together in the House of Commons. Do you think there's any chance that those two parties will merge? It's interesting, you know, a long time ago, uh, we used to talk amongst ourselves, and I remember talking to Tommy Douglas and uh, David Lewis about this once, and I remember Tommy Douglas saying, well, if we gave a convention tomorrow, all the wrong people would come. And I don't think it's likely in our political lifetime. Maybe it will. What do you think, Jack? I think there'll be a kind of natural melding one of these days with the uh, left wing of the Liberal Party, and I'm sure uh, the right wing of the NDP Party, because they're practically indistinguishable on many occasions. But, and the NDP doesn't get the representation it deserves on the basis of the mass vote it has in the country. You know what, that, I think it's already happened here in BC with the polarization between the social credit and the New Democrats. Left-wing liberals have gone off and voted New Democrat, and the right-wing ones have gone the other way. Well, I think we have an appalling situation in British Columbia. I don't care. So do I. That's why I fought it for 34 yeah, years. Yeah, but it, it is <laughs> absolutely appalling that we, I mean, Van der Zam, and we've all been very nice to him tonight, is not a man whose philosophy you can lay on the table because it would seem that the premiers of British Columbia and the social credit just tend to become straight populist, almost like Mulroney's trying to do just now. If you've got enough money to make some people happy, do it. And I think political philosophy as such has been going down the tube. Well, while you're on holiday, Jack, I'm going to start my Jack Webster for future Premier of oh, British no, Columbia no, campaign. No, 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 <laughs> Thank no, no, no. you for calling. We'll go to our next call. 
Go ahead. Hello. Yes. Hello. I have a personal message for Mrs. Uh, Campanola, please. Yes, go ahead. I'm listening. Uh, this is uh, the Eggman's daughter. Oh, yes. <laughs> and you're this far away from home? Uh, I'm uh, in Vancouver right now, but I'll be going home for uh, for Christmas next week, and unfortunately, I'll be unable to watch you on TV. It's uh, well, quite give my love to Glenn. We always <laughs> like to see your pretty face. <laughs> give my love to Glenn Gary, Prescott, Russell, and the Ottawa Valley. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. That's your Eggman's daughter from <laughs> Ottawa. Well, uh, the Eggman is a friend of Don Boudouya, oh, the, yes. the Member of Parliament. Here we are. Go ahead. You're on the air. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Yes, I would like to get um, Jack's... Make it quick. Hello? Yes, say something. Uh, I would like to get Jack's opinion on the, on the BC's Federal's... Um, no, on the... On the I'm sorry, too slow. Yeah, no, gotta we move just on. couldn't get it. But as a matter of fact, we're, we're just about out of time. I see we've got 30 seconds left. Ah, well. Now, um, you start Monday. Mm -hmm. Monday, what day is tomorrow? Friday. Friday on the 15th. Tomorrow night, I've got John Turner on. I was to have Edgar Kaiser on, but they don't like uh, the questions I wanted to ask, so they can't. I noticed today. you mentioned that when you were talking with the Prime Minister. My thanks to you, Iona, and uh, I shall be back after the break.